Hello and welcome to the Trusted Advisor, a channel focused podcast and video series powered by the Retail Solutions Providers Association. I'm Jim Roddy, your host for today. Thank you so much for joining us. Today on the podcast, we'll be talking about the ISV of the future with two special guests who know the retail IT software developer industry well. Eileen Maldonado is a product manager in the System Devices Group for Epson. Among her duties are working with key ISV partners to help them replace entrenched competitors. Prior to her five years at Epson, Eileen was a channel manager, a channel marketing manager at Belkin International. Hi, Eileen. Glad we could talk today. Hi. Thank you for having me. Yeah, no, thrilled to have you here. Our second special guest is George Hudock, the pub, uh, business development manager at DataCap, where he's worked for seven years. Among George's responsibilities are establishing and maintaining relationships with point of sale software developers. And to show how thoroughly we prepare for these podcasts, about 15 years ago, George was a team captain and the starting first baseman at Division I LaSalle University, and he led the team in home runs for three consecutive seasons. So George, it's great to have you here. And are my facts about your athletic prowess accurate? Uh, they are. I'm, I'm I'm really impressed, Jim. Thanks for doing a little bit of background there. <laughs> sure. Pleasure to be with you. Thanks for having me. No, glad to have you. I also noted that you got picked off twice your senior year, but maybe if we have to, <laughs> we, can, we can talk about that later and how that happened. So, Pull up some Google images, right? <laughs> exactly right. And and Eileen, I'm sorry, I couldn't find a lot about you on the internet. I I found a picture, I think it was you, from 2016. I think it was a Halloween picture. You were dressed oh. up as a colorful skeleton. Unless that's how you dress every day, other than today. I didn't want to judge, but it's, I'm guessing it was from uh, from Halloween. It was from Halloween. And actually, I used to be Eileen Calderon, and that's probably why you couldn't find me. Well, there we go. <laughs> All right. Well, when we bring you back for another episode of the uh, the podcast, we'll we'll dig in a little bit more. So, well, Eileen and George, it's great to have you here. So let's rock and roll and jump into it. So you both work with a variety of ISVs. So you have the perspective where you can compare and contrast their strategies and their tactics. You get to see what drives business for them and then what doesn't work. So let's talk first about effective go-to-market strategies. And Eileen, can you start us off? So from a go-to-market standpoint, What's worked and what's around the corner for ISVs? You know, I think this pandemic has forced us all to change our go to market strategies. So everything that we developed, uh, you know, 18 months ago is out of the door. And that's when you put your plan together for this year. Uh, so what I've seen the most successful do is pivot their entire marketing plan to really um, almost 100% digital. So digital advertising, we're looking at social media. Um, I've seen really effective webinars, increased use of personalized e-communication. So when we're looking at email blasts that are being sent out, um, in my opinion, I think LinkedIn is probably one of the best tools that people have used. If they're focused on uh, case studies, walking people through the customer journey, really focusing on how they can help, especially during COVID, whether that's uh, now introducing online ordering and how uh, a traditional you know, brick and mortar retailer can take advantage of um, uh, you know, their customer base online and, and expand. Also people who focus on niche market segments. So if you're focused, uh, for example, just on you know, uh, on the golf industry and really focus uh, and, and zero in. I think that's been really cool and effective. Um, around the corner, I think we're going to continue to see diminished travel uh, probably through 2022. So I think we're in this for another year. I think that we're going to continue to see webinars that are highly focused, a lot more of them, I mean, really segmented. So focused on customized training sessions uh, and really helping partners understand why your solution is the best or helping a sales team understand what's really the nuances between the products that they're carrying. And again, just really um, that highly personalized content. So whether it's uh, segmenting your email database and, and figuring out um, which customers haven't purchased from you in a while or which are focused on, again, that niche market and creating those assets. I think that's what we're going to continue to see. And I think that's um, really been effective, especially as a consumer receiving those messages. I've, I've spent much more than I've needed to during this pandemic. Got it. Well, thank you. So before we dive into some of those that you brought up, George, I want to get your take on this as well. Um, what would you add to yeah. what uh, Eileen said, or what would you emphasize what she said in terms of what's worked uh, and what's around the corner for ISVs for go-to-market? 
Yeah, many great points uh, by Eileen there. You know, if I could kind of feather in there a little bit. You know, what, what we're seeing uh, in the ISD side is, is, is what's been successful. Is guys can bounce really between two strategies. One being a kind of a feedback-driven loop, and then the other side is about being proactive and really being the, the trusted advisor. On the feedback-driven loop side, it's, it's about staying in constant, constant communication with merchants, doing those needs assessments, uh, staying in tune with the clients, uh, understanding their needs. Uh, and then bringing that back, building out the, the product roadmap in a way that caters to your, your customers, right? That's really it. That's actually a lot of the roadmap of DataCap built, right? We work with a ton of ISVs. They're constantly working with their end user clients, bringing that feedback back. And that's how we, one of the strategies we use here at DataCap to, to build out our roadmap. Uh, on the other side, it's, it's, it's taking all that, packaging it up and being a trusted advisor, being more proactive. Uh, on this side, instead of the open com uh, conversation with the end user, here's a, an open communication with your vendor partners. Uh, making sure you're up to date on the latest and the greatest, uh, building that out into your roadmap, and then taking that directly to 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 your end users. Right, that's what's really gonna that's what helps to re-cement your value uh, with your customers. Uh, you know, we see a lot of this around uh, value-added services, right? Uh, especially with COVID, uh, it's, it's so important right now. So uh, introducing uh, programs and products around gift, e-commerce, and above store payments, which is huge. It's been a huge drive and push here with COVID. Uh, mobility opportunities now, and really things you can build around SaaS, right? So you want to be able to build recurring revenue as an ISV, uh, while also driving value to the end users because you're bringing new products and new solutions into merchants that can help improve their bottom line. Uh, from there, you know, adding on to what Eileen said, the most successful ISVs we see are taking these success stories, they're building out case studies, uh, mm -hmm. building partner spotlights, blasting that out on social media, using all those tools in the digital age we're in right now, again, especially with COVID when everybody's, you know, at home or working from home. And then, you know, old school sales asking for referrals, right? We see that being successful with ISVs as well. Um, you know, about what's around the corner, I think we're already we're already kind of there with, with COVID. It's, it's, it's been a transformational shift. Um, you know, it, it's about ISVs being able to, to see this coming and be able to, you know, turn the, turn the ship, adapt quickly. Uh, and make changes that are that that they need to make to be successful in the market. I mean, COVID is, is certainly uh, the transform like the transformational. Uh, it, it's been a transformational shift here in, in in how you know consumers are interacting with merchants, and ISVs just need to be paying careful attention to that to stay on the cutting edge. Got it. So let's drill down. Thank you both for those answers. I thought those were great, and it's going to give the ISVs listening to this a, a long list uh, for them to consider. I want to dive into a couple. George, you had mentioned constant communication. How are they doing that? Because I can say I'm on the receiving end, not necessarily from an ISV standpoint, of constant communication mm -hmm. in the form of two emails a day, two emails a day, you know, and something like that. Mm -hmm. And that is just not very persuasive. What do you see as effective in terms of constant communication? What are the methods that are working that other ISVs might uh, want to adopt? So ISVs, uh, you know, d working directly with end users, I think it's uh, part of a, a, a newsletter campaign or a blast that might be targeted based on certain pieces of functionality, you know, uh, maybe a bi-weekly or monthly basis there, or, or when new pieces of technology are, are built out. On the open communication with vendors, I think I think that could almost be a, a weekly or a bi-weekly uh, activity, right? Uh, the ISVs in the space now deal with so many different vendors, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's a... Uh, it's a struggle to stay in contact with all of them, but it's so necessary uh, at, at this point now to make sure you're you're building a tool set that's going to keep your merchants interested. If you do have a uh, if you have a VAR strategy, keep keep you know, put essentially putting tools into the VAR's tool belt that they can be out there talking to merchants about because that's so important as well. A, a lot of these dealers out there sell multiple solutions, so you want to make sure you're building out those features and functionality that that they enjoy talking about and that makes sense in, in the current climate. Got it. Thanks. And Eileen, uh, you had talked about webinars. And so, you know, when I hear about webinars or when I've attended webinars, a lot of them are, quite frankly, really boring. I mean, I don't mean to be rude, yeah. but, you know, a lot of times B2B people interpret that as boring to boring and they just, you know, <laughs> webinars and just be like another slide, another slide and let's turn it over to so and so. And then there's just really monotone. So I guess what are what are you seeing that are making webinars effective is it a different format or is it simply the same format and you know when you have limited options uh, to choose from you know people are choosing uh, webinars i guess what are you seeing that's working what would you recommend isvs that would work from a webinar standpoint and to uh, to win over a curmudgeon like me who's uh, been victim to uh, subject to a whole lot of boring webinars uh, during my time uh i i do agree they they can be a bit um a bit stale i 
what I've seen uh, successfully done is actually uh, tailoring the messaging to that team. So sure, the same slides can be applied to a ton of, you know, to, to your entire sales team. If you have a specific part of the team that's only focused on MPOS, for example, the entire message should be focused on that with a deep dive into what are the market trends? What, what actually allows them to sell your product easier? Is it the key sound bites? Is it one pagers that help? So incorporating that in, um, I also have seen gamification. I personally have received gifts in the mail to attend specific training sessions. I think those are fun. If there's a way for you to turn around and win a prize at the end, I think, especially if the prize is worth it, I think that's one way that um, I've seen people uh, receive a, I would not only say higher turnout, but actual interest. So if you have a content that's buried in and you're giving out, for example, a number that flashed and, and participating that way. And it turned it into something that was fun. I've seen people um, turn into leverage other assets like uh, I think it was um, Freshly where food was delivered and there's another part, you know, it's almost like a, an experience that's tied into that webinar. So sure, you know, really highly customize the content, make sure it's relevant to that team. Um, to George's point, give them the tools that they need so that it's easier to sell your product. You know, people are, um, you know, people want those sound bites and we sell what's easier. Um, and then just make it fun and make it short. I don't need to sit on a three hour webinar. So 17 people can yep. chat, you know. <laughs> God, I know that's a good point. So like takeaways from that would be if you're going to have a webinar, make sure first it's focused on a certain niche, like just don't have it to try to appeal to all people. Like, and even if you only get 25 people, 50 people, 75, right? If you don't have to be a big number, but it has to be really niche for them. And then you said be creative. Like uh, there's somebody who I saw whenever they do webinars, they will constantly ask questions and they'll just say, if you agree, press one. If you don't, press zero. And then you can see people in the chat and at least, you know, has a change of pace uh, from an audience standpoint. And I guess also don't start your webinar. This is maybe a personal pet peeve of mine with, let's go over the history of our company. And here's a picture of our building. Like nobody right. wants to see that, right? Like get to the mm -hmm. uh, get to the key key part of it. Uh, there's also a book I always recommend. Uh, it's called Do You Talk Funny. Uh, I actually have it right over there. Do You Talk Funny by David Nihill, and he talks about how when you're giving a presentation with slides, every few minutes or so, put a fun slide up there, right? Just to change the pace. You know, comedians can keep our, our attention for an hour and a half without any slides. If you've got a slide, use it and, and be fun. So, okay, well, maybe I should not uh, keep going down that path and turn this into something else. But I guess I'm glad to see we're getting out of this constant communication, personalized communication, and uh, creative, short, niche-focused webinars. So good takeaways for, for our listeners. So, all right, well, let's keep going on talking about uh, the ISV, the future. Let's talk about partnerships. And so, George, if we can start with you. So what partnerships do you think are going to be most effective for ISVs going forward? You kind of alluded to it in, in your first question there. They can go a bunch of different directions from one ISV to another, ISV to vendor, ISVs to distributors, and then the distributors can help them partner with a lot of vendors. There's also ISV to VAR, ISV to processor, is any one of those going to be more valuable down the road than another? Or is it all of the above? Or is it something that I didn't mention? Yeah, not much to talk about there, right, Jim? No, I'm just kidding. No, pretty simple uh, business yeah. model. <laughs> so, so a couple of things come to mind. Obviously, you know, I'll build on what we were talking about earlier. ISV to vendor is up there. It's very important, right? It's, it's about staying in touch with your vendors. Keep that open line of communication, as we discussed. Make sure you're staying up to date on new products and functionality. You, you always have to focus on creating uh, and delivering impactful solutions to merchants. Improve their bottom line, right? At the end of the day, people are in business to make money, so you need to you need to stay focused on that. Help drive new revenues. Um, you know, you can use Eileen and Epson as an example here. ISV should be reaching out to the vendors. Hey, hey, Epson, uh, with the current climate, talk to me about uh, your uh, your printers here. Can you do QR code technology to support contactless payments? Um, you know, do you uh, have mobile printer options available that uh, could help servers turn tables quicker. And so those, those are the kind of conversations that ISVs need to keep open and, and, and uh, with with vendor partners. Um, ISV to processor is also a very important partnership that, that, that warrants uh, some conversation. 
Um, you know, we see a lot of ISVs embracing more of a, a, an agnostic approach here uh, at, at the processor level. So, you know, instead of instead of maybe uh, choosing to work with one or uh, one processor, uh, guys are going out and trying to, to forge relationships with as many processors as they possibly can. Think of this like a diversification strategy, right? Think about your 401k. Do you want to invest all your money in one company or, or uh, do you want to put yourself in a position where you spread your risk, spread your reward? Um, you know, we're, this is so important, too, because we're seeing a lot of consolidation in the space on the processor side. And, and that's, that's caused some pain for folks uh, that, that rely on these credit card processing residuals as a, uh, you know, for, for folks that are forecast, forecasting that as revenue streams. Right. So and then throw COVID on top of that. It, it's closed down a lot of merchants. Uh, it's slowed a lot of merchants down. So, so those residuals have really been shrinking. Right. So we think residuals are great. We think, uh, you know. Uh, ISV should be out forging these relationships and negotiating those revenue share agreements. That's awesome. You want, you want that money to come in, but have that be icing on top of the cake, right? Um, you know, where you want to build your forecastable recurring revenues around value added services, and, you know, and then, and then the credit card processing residuals just, just, just come in on the side. Um, you know, again, we, we've talked about this a little bit, but QR codes, you know, e-commerce now and above, above store payments, gift and loyalty, networking, digital signage, kiosks, mobility. Uh, these are, these are things that ICs need to be focusing on building into their roadmap, building into their architecture, and then pushing them downstream. Um, it's so important that the, these uh, you build this robust uh, platform and, and take it downstream because if not, you better believe the the competition's out there knocking on uh, knocking on all your merchant stores, right? So you have the Toast, the Clover, and the Square out there, right? They're building the function functionality out, the verticalizing their solution, and they're competing with you on a daily basis. So um, you know it's important. Uh, you know, so I got off on a little bit of a tangent there, but just kind of talking through, uh, you know, what the perspective should be there and, and how we see uh, ISVs of the future being successful in that in that space. Um, obviously, VAR, VARs, uh, resellers, uh, hugely important. Uh, if you have that channel strategy, you got to keep that constant uh, that constant communication going right now. That education is very difficult right now, right? Because a lot of ISVs have, have dealer events. Um, you know, in-person dealer events, which are great, gives people an, an opportunity to get together and talk through the challenges they're seeing in the space. And we can't do that right now. Uh, and what, what we see is successful ICs going toward the digital perspective. You know, they're, they're, they're putting the webinars together. Um, they're adapting quickly. And, and, you know, those are the guys we think are really going to be the most successful here. Got it. Thank you. And don't apologize for tangents. That's why we kind of have this yeah. long format. You know, it's not like we have a three minute interview here. So uh, we want you to yeah. go in depth and uh, and appreciate you sharing that. So um, I, I lean it's, you know, George's answer was essentially, you know, all of the above, like you've got to make sure you pay attention, don't neglect any of those uh, avenues. So I guess I can ask you, what do you want to add on to what George said? And if you also feel it's all of the above, how do ISVs tackle all these avenues? Because they're typically SMBs and they have limited resources. It's not like they can have, you know, 10 people to put on, uh, you know, working on all these relationships. What's your take on the partnership angle? Sure. So uh, I think George is spot on. Everything's important. I would add um, also the ISV to OEM relationship where they have the ability, you know, ISVs move so fast. They're working on cutting edge technology. Uh, it's great to partner with some of these larger OEMs and, and leverage so specific solutions um, can win over those larger end users. End users are now expecting, they want the bells, the whistles, the icing on the cake, they want it all. And if an OEM can't do that and an ISV has a specialty, that's a great partnership. Um, to George's point, you know, the ISV should be agnostic. You should work with tons of people. Um, I would say, uh, how do you eat the elephant one bite at a time? So how do you target all of them, you know, uh, prioritize, figure out who's going to give you the most, what's the biggest bang for your buck, and then start from there, whether it's with the vendor, pick your top two vendors that you'd like to work with and figure out what they can do for you. Reach out to them. Um, vendors are established and they have programs for ISVs and they can help them with marketing development funds. They can give them access to marketing, PR, social media teams to help them with their strategy. You don't have to do this alone. And the bigger players um, know that the smaller, you know, they're, they're up and coming, they're the future of, of point of sale. It's really important to make sure that they're supported um, so just figure out what's the most important piece to that. Uh, make sure that you're talking to the right people, right? Sounds like George is exactly the person that you should chat with. He's going to connect you with the right players. Product management is always happy, but I always partner with my sales team because they are the 
they are the gateway to my customers. So I want to make sure that I'm uh, supporting them however I can, whether it's making sure additional funding, uh, what, making sure that demo units are sent out to them. And also, um, from this from this vendor's perspective, uh, we have our fingers across the channel so we can figure out, OK, this is a great partnership. This ISV should be talking to this far and, and try to you know, um, match make and make sure that they're able to both have a reciprocal uh, relationship and it's, it benefits all of us. Uh, so I think that, yeah, George is spot on with his yeah. entire feedback. And it seems like what both of you alluded to, and I know when I talk to a lot of ISVs who are starting to really, you know, they've got their product, they're ready to go to market. Sometimes they think it's going to be some, you know, hockey stick, you know, low sales, suddenly fast sales. But it's a it's a grind. Like working with a vendor, that's not like a one call business. And then vendors are going to introduce you to different people or, you know, trying to find a, a good some, you know, good VAR to go to to uh, to go to market with. You got to talk to a lot of different folks in order to find the right fit for you so i don't know if either one of you wants to weigh in on that like i don't mean to be negative on it it's just a grind it's more of a marathon than it is a, a sprint and you've just got to make sure you keep keep running and put one foot in front of the other in order to make these partnerships work i'm not sure if one of you feel free to disagree yeah. with me if you like that that make the no no makes it <laughs> well to, to go to eileen's point uh i, I think you know merchants expect they see they see the bells and whistles and they expect them immediately right and it, it doesn't happen that fast right for for ISVs to make these changes and incorporate incorporate uh, these pro products, and you know, it involves uh, development, building out support mechanisms. Uh, so, so it's all about that feedback loop too. You know, and it's kind of old school sales. It's getting out there, it's doing the needs assessment, understanding what these merchants need, developing the business case to justify building this stuff in, and then building that roadmap out, bu building the architecture, building the support mechanism, and then taking it to market. So, you're right. It, it's not the hockey stick. It, it takes some time. Uh, and, and, you know, COVID kind of brought it all down at once, right? So there were so many changes that were so demanding on all of these different software developers to adapt quickly. So it's, it's an interesting time and it's an interesting dynamic for sure. Yeah, and I'm hoping we can expand upon a point that Eileen, you, you touched on where you said ISVs really are the future. Like that's how VAR see them, that's how vendors see them, that's how distributors see them. So do you see our channel becoming more ISV centric. Like I'm starting to see more resellers uh, are developing their own intellectual property as a differentiator. They become hybrid ISV VARs. Not only that, we see direct ISVs are emerging with their own software. So those are folks who are smaller. They don't necessarily have a channel. They go directly to the merchant. And they're especially growing inside of those those specialty niches. So I guess back to my original question, is that what you're seeing? Are you seeing our channel becoming more ISV centric, not that VARs aren't important, but ISVs continue to grow uh, in the minds of everybody in terms of uh, importance and really making this channel move. Oh, absolutely. So uh, when I was uh, brought on to the team, it was uh, very clear from the data that, uh, you know, this, this is the future of, of what we're working on and um, how it impacts roadmap. Uh, we want to make sure that it's every every feature that an ISV is asking for, how do we incorporate that? Not only in products that are just MPOS focused, which are the product lines that I manage, but also how do we incorporate those key features into traditional products? Because ISVs are now selling to larger end users. They are winning the bigger business and they need different types of products that have greater reliability. So how do we make sure that everything has um, uh, online ordering capabilities. How do we make sure that everything has multiple um, peripheral connectivity support? How do we maintain, uh, you know, how are we leapfrogging? How are we addressing the needs five years out because roadmaps take a while to develop. So how are we working on that? So definitely everything is developed especially with that ISV in mind. It's And it's funny, it's we're developing for technology that doesn't exist yet, which is it, which is really interesting. So how do we build the architecture that George had mentioned when I don't know the end game? I'm, I'm making educated guesses, but I want to make sure that my ISV customer feels supported. You know, where I'm able to do this by talking to a lot of the ISVs and building out those relationships myself. Um, I, I'm very fortunate. I have an amazing sales team and they will bring me onto calls, which is great because of COVID. I can jump. It's much easier than jumping on a plane. I can get that information and then um, incorporate that into my roadmaps and the um, in the sales plans that we have developed. Uh, 
it allows me to shift my go to market strategy so that I'm talking to customers and in terms um, that they understand and that they actually care about. Right. How do I get them to show up to my webinar? I need niche content for them. Yes. Yeah. And you got to get to know them better. No substitute for, for getting closer to them. Uh, George, before we take a quick break, uh, your take on the channel becoming more ISV centric. Yeah, yeah, no, we, we, we do see uh, a lot of the vert verticalization, you know, you talk about there. Um, uh, as far as becoming a more of a hybrid ISV, we're seeing a lot of folks at ISO status as well. So a lot of these guys are building in uh, processing services uh, to their offering as well. So it's, it's all become very blended. Uh, you know, we're, we're, we obviously we urge folks to be careful, be very strategic. Uh, don't, you know, be careful not to create conflicts of interest in this space. Don't be short-sighted, you know, build, build a sustainable business model that works in the ecosystem. Um, um, uh, with the future in mind, um, you know, uh, kind of expand a little bit there. What we are seeing, uh, COVID has created a lot of these new emerging technologies, and a lot of them now have created white labeling opportunities, right? So we do see bars and ISVs now that uh, choose to maybe work with somebody and, and white label their technology and push it downstream uh, versus versus creating this themselves, right? Uh, so that allows them to partner with their vendors, not compete with their vendors, uh, and, and then it also um, it's also a savings in that you don't have to hire a development staff to build this stuff out, and then you don't need to hire or train a, your support uh, staff to be able to to, uh, to support these this architecture as well. So it's kind of like staying in your lane, doing what you do really well, and, and still being able to partner in the ecosystem. Um, you know, really, really to, to address to really get at the core of your question, it, it's all about adapting to the needs of the merchant. Uh, we're, we're seeing the really good VARs and ICs out there that are really tuned in and know what's going on and see the changes. They're finding each other out there. Uh, it, you know, and, and again, we keep going back to COVID, but uh, we've seen some really interesting partnerships come about, um, you know, kiosks, uh, mobile payments. We, we, we actually, uh, we have a, an unintended partner that's doing pay by face with biometrics. So think about that, talk, talk about contact free, you're able to order and pay by your face. So, you know, these people come up with novel solutions here with, with the problems we're seeing in the space. So, um, you know, the, the folks who are on the, the, the bleeding edge of all this are the guys that are going to be the most successful. Got it. Got it. Thank you for that. Um, you know, it, it's interesting to see that uh, these ISVs, you know, just continue to rise in terms of they come out of nowhere. Like you said, it's it's hard as uh, you mentioned, Eileen. You don't know where the technologies. You don't even know where some of these ISVs are, and they kind of pop up on the scene and have uh, some interesting technology to offer. And we've all got to be ready for it and really, really be agile. That seems to be a a big thing that's uh, that's going on. Anybody who's working with ISV. So, well, let's pause here for a moment to let our listeners and viewers know an RSP membership has never been more valuable or more affordable. The RSP has expanded its VAR and ISV member benefits to include discounts on health insurance, HR services, office supplies, and shipping. Also, RSP members now have access to a legal advisor, a security advisor, and a VAR and ISV business advisor. That's all included in your annual RSP membership, which for resellers starts at just $250 a year. And for direct independent software developers, it's only $300 a year. And so uh, without an RSP membership, you'll either spend thousands of dollars paying an outside consultant who doesn't know the channel, or you'll end up going it alone during these turbulent times in our industry. Accelerate your success by joining the RSPA today. Also, thanks to our sponsors who support the RSP community and make this podcast and video series possible. Our platinum sponsors are Blue Star, Heartland, ScantSource, and Shift4 Payments. And also thanks to Epson and Datacap, uh, strong sponsors of the RSPA as well. To receive the benefits of an RSP membership or RSP sponsorship, email membership at gorspa.org. Um, so we talked about resellers and we we're just saying how important ISVs have become, but where we really see ISVs accelerate their growth is once they build a reseller channel. And so George, if we can start with you and dive a little bit more into the ISV reseller relationship, what do you see as some of the first steps an ISV should take if they're going to build out an effective reseller program? Obviously you can't take a step one through step a million at this point, but what are some of the mm -hmm. early things they need to do to get, uh, to get started right. My old, since we talked about your college sports, my college basketball coach used to say, if it starts right, it finishes right. If it starts right, it finishes right. So what's a way that an ISV can start right with a reseller program? Yeah, so, so it's a time for introspection, right? We see a lot of ISVs that might start off as a direct selling ISV, but then they start to scale and they realize that uh, a channel strategy makes the most sense for them. So that's a, a time to sit back and, and take a look at the business. Um, it's all about at that point, I think setting a, a, a creating a great solution, but, but setting a good price point that's going to provide room for margin, right? Dealers dealers need to make money. They need they need to put food on the table, right? So 
uh, you, you need to, you need to have that stable price point with with room in there for margins. So these guys can go out and make money, but still be competitive in the market. Uh, then you know, going back to the direct versus channel strategy uh, topic, you know, you, you need to make sure you're eliminating any of these conflicts of interest. Uh, if you're going to continue to sell direct, you really need to manage that thinking. You need to manage those potential conflicts, right? You don't want to, you don't want to burn the dealers. You need to have a, a, a strategy in place there to where it works for all parties. Um, and then, and then, you know, after that, it's, it's just to kind of keep it simple. It's, it's going back to that, uh, uh, you know, constant communication through, through the channel. How are you going to do that? Educational events, webinars, uh, training, uh, and, and keep that good continual feedback loop, right? So you, you're going to essentially trust these people as your independent sales force. So you need to value their opinions and the feedback that comes back. You need to think about how you're going to take that and build it into your product roadmap. And then again, we keep coming back to it, but uh, being in communication with your vendors, right? So a lot of these, uh, a lot of these dealers are out there. They sell multiple point of sale packages. You want to make sure, you, as an ISV, you're building out um, the, the coolest, latest, and greatest features and functionality, so that you're putting these tools in, in the, the VARS tool belt, so that when they go out there, you're the first, the, the first thing the dealer's talking about when he goes in to, to talk with a new merchant. It's all, it's all there. You know, you're kind of top of mind, uh, and uh, again, you know, on the bleeding edge there from a technology perspective. Yeah, George, I can say I, you showed your uh, your acumen, I think, with uh, your answer there. And uh, I also talked with a new RSP ISV member yesterday. And so while they're a new ISV, they brought in some veteran people to start their channel. And they talked about, here's what the product does, but they quickly got to, here's how much money VARS can make. And we're looking for real partnerships. We're not just looking for a sales force out there. And oftentimes I see a lot of ISVs, they just get so mesmerized with their product. And they think, you know, if it's a great product, everyone's gonna run and wanna sell it. But you know, when you're presenting to a reseller, the reseller's like, that's neat and all, but I'm I gonna be able to make money off this, right? Like this isn't a charity that we're talking about. So yeah, the product, are they making money and have a real a real partnership and a real program? So, so that's starting up. Eileen, can you answer for us, what about the ISVs who already have a strong channel. What are you seeing the best ones doing that maybe their competition isn't uh, from working with their their VAR standpoint? Yeah, I'm going to hit on what George just said about communication and that VAR tool belt. I think for a lot of our, for any ISV, go back to your marketing strategy, specifically targeting your resellers and make sure that you have ease of use and ease of setup. That I'm going to sell the easiest thing. It's I know it, I have the talking points, I can get the message across and then I can get to that next sale, right? We're, you're going to sell what's easiest and we, we all do that. So, you know, and also just keeping in mind that, and again, to George's point, like resellers work with multiple ISVs. That team has everybody, everybody's system is great. So keep it top of mind, but make it really easy to sell. Here are my bullet points, here's my value proposition. This is why you want to sell my product and that's how you win, uh, you know, really specifically target them. That's what I, I think in a nutshell, target them, niche communication, like keep, stay top of mind, all of George's points. Yep. Exactly. And, and if I could add to that, SaaS friendly, right? I mean, uh, for castable recurring revenue is, is where it's at today. It's how dealers are able to build out robust business models that can, it can uh, sustain through slowdowns like we're seeing right now. It's, it's so important. So ICs need to be thinking about that as well. Uh, and then Eileen hit it on the head, right? So sales and marketing support, you know, what are you going to do? What are you going to do to support now your sales force who's out there working for you? And one of the big things too is technical support. Uh, dealers, you don't want to burn the dealer, right? So when, um, if a dealer's going to sell your product and they need technical support, you got to have a, you got to have a, a, a robust support department that's going to pick up the phone and be there for them. Manage all the different constituents and play all the different vendors because right, they're the gatekeeper here. Right? The ISV is the one who's plugging all this technology in and making all this stuff work. Mm -hmm. So the dealer needs to, to know where they can get uh, where they can get good answers. So um, you know that's that's the support thing is we, we see it here uh, on the data cap side. I mean, ISVs with solid and stable support departments uh, tend to win. Uh, and then it's just staying committed to the channel, right? Even during the difficult times here, it's staying committed, uh, believing in them, and working with them. But I have to say, I'm enjoying this conversation with you guys. I'm also thinking selfishly, one of my roles I play with the RSPA is as a business coach, a business advisor to a lot of software developers. 
And now I'm not going to have to engage in those conversations. I'm just going to say, listen to that podcast with Eileen and George, <laughs> because you guys are, no, really, you were hitting on all the key points because you're so engaged uh, in the channel that these startup ISVs aren't. So really like these points uh, that you're emphasizing. So a lot of that was with folks who are starting a channel. And I'm curious, George, if you can answer this first and talk about the legacy ISVs. You know, it's easy. I shouldn't say easy, but it's less complex for a startup to change and adapt because, you know, they have a small group. They have fewer moving parts, but, um, you know, more established developers, they have a bigger ship to turn. What are you seeing? Maybe some of those more established legacy channel focused ISVs. How are they responding, uh, you know, to be ready for 2021 and beyond? Yeah, um, so, so it's a great question. You know, for, from our standpoint, we sit in the middle of a lot of different ISVs, large and small. You know, we, we see positive and negative examples on both sides. Uh, so, so size really hasn't come into it in, in our in our perspective and what we're seeing. It, it's the uh, ISVs that are, are really uh, committed to continuous learning, continuous improvement. The guys that, I won't call them squeaky wheels, but they're all, always the ones reaching out. Hey, what's, what's the latest and greatest? Are you guys doing this? I saw, I, or I read this case study, or I, I see what's going on over here. Like what's but what are you doing to build this out so that we can build our product out? So those are the folks that, that um, you know, aren't being complacent. I think that's the big thing. You can't be complacent. Uh, and again, we keep going to COVID, but there's a perfect example of people that were just kind of sitting on their hands here uh, are, are hurting because they weren't staying on the cutting edge and developing solutions that are going to keep their businesses moving through uh, the current climate we're in. So, you know, you know again, it's, it's, it's really about um, it's really about the guys who are, always building out that pro product roadmap and learning that, that are being most successful. So, you know, it, and it's it, like, the fundamental shift is really exposed to a lot of those guys that aren't, aren't staying current. So. Yeah. And so Eileen, what are you seeing from some of those, uh, you know, more legacy ISVs who have a channel, what are they doing to adapt and to innovate? Uh, you know, I think the most successful players are getting outside of their comfort zone, you know, back to George's point, really staying consistent, um, staying, you know, keeping their finger on the pulse, what are the case studies that are being released, figuring out what their competitors are doing, what they're doing well, what are they, uh, what's reached, and really pivoting, pivoting their strategy uh, and, and trying to figure out how they can change uh, margins and profitability for the partners, talking to new partners and figuring out what new technology is out there. I think uh, losing a lot of our trade shows is really detrimental just because we have so many new players that are able to come in through tech pavilions or running into people uh, at a restaurant and kind of learning about what what's new, the latest and greatest, what's coming up, what are um, relationships. So I think people who are leaving that comfort zone and reaching out to partners they've never worked with before, um, picking up the phone and trying to figure out, you know, what, how, where is the industry moving? So I think that's what's been really successful. Um, I think that the ISVs with the strongest channels have the opportunity to go back and data mine. They have a much larger customer base and then and they have an opportunity to um, really like focus on that, that customer base, the niche and figure out what was most profitable and go after those customers. So I think revisiting. So I think it's internal reflecting, reshifting and then external out of your out of your comfort zone, who are the new vendors, what else are people doing, um, and just building out their networks. And it's harder for people because without a trade show, you're essentially cold calling on LinkedIn. Right, right. Uh, but that's an interesting perspective you had in terms of the startup ISVs have fewer merchants, so they have fewer data to say, here's where we should go. Never thought of it that way. The legacy uh, ISVs through their channel partners can go and find out from their merchants uh, exactly what they're looking for. And, and they can get way more data uh, and way faster and, and probably get a more accurate uh, area in terms of where they should where they should pivot their business. So, all right, just a couple more questions left. And I guess I'll go around the horn really quickly on this one. And you guys can just give a general one if you don't want to share the specific thing, but I'll give my exact date. So I'm 50 years old. So George, how old are you? 37. 37. Eileen, how old are you? 38. 38. All right. So we've got your third in your 30s. You guys are the newer generation. And so I want to get your perspective and see how your generation is impacting the channel. So some folks have told me, you know, the, the next generation is more comfortable with pay as you go subscription models. I've also heard millennials would prefer to own a software company versus a traditional POS dealer. How do you see and Eileen, if you can start first, how do you see younger folks like yourself? 
uh, changing the the retail IT channel as opposed to the 50 year olds, 60 year olds, 70 year olds, uh, you know, mm -hmm. who are in the second half of their career. You know, I think it's a really exciting time to be in this space. I've spent about 10 years in consumer electronics. Uh, I worked on uh, home automation products before we all knew what those oh, were. Yeah. Uh, so I think it's really cool how fast this is moving. I feel like my generation, George, I'm a lump you in here. So our generation adopts technology much quicker and my expectations are forcing um, manufacturers to change. I expect that your online, um, your online platform talks to your in-store platform. So I have a seamless uh, return. Or if I'm in store and I can't find my size, I expect to jump on your website and have it shipped to my house instantly. So my expectations are have really changed um, the, I would say timeline in which um, retailers and, and manufacturers adopt technology. Uh, the product lines I manage are a great example, uh, you know, MPOS uh, changed the game in, uh, for my career, and now I develop products that are, are specifically focused on that. So that's pretty cool to me. And having seen my product out in the market and realizing I'm helping a retailer, but I would say our generation has adopted technology, and now we're forcing it to, uh, we're forcing everyone to keep up with us. And uh, my, I would say, uh, younger nieces and nephews who are you know, uh, one generation behind are much better at this and will keep me on my toes. So I think that's what we've come to expect and it forces us to continue to learn. Yeah, it's funny that you said about the expectations because I don't know, if, have you guys ever dialed a rotary phone? Like you've ever seen, like if you, you know, maybe while, you saw it at yeah. one point in your life. <laughs> like I remember the phones with the cords and the rotary dial. Like, And so my expectations like of whatever I'm able to do on my phone are just like, I'm, I would say I'm still fascinated by it, but I almost feel like, that's great, but if you grew up with something that was already closer to that, yeah, your expectations uh, would be higher. So yeah, certainly something for the 50-year-olds and 60-year-olds to keep in mind, what might be satisfying us uh, isn't satisfying the younger generation. So uh, George, what, what's your take? How are, how are you 30-somethings gonna change and are changing the retail IT channel? Yeah, I, I think Eileen I nailed it. Uh, I, I think you know one of the other big movements here is think, uh, people are expecting more of a consumerized uh, approach or a consumerized product, much much like the mobile phone. Things, things should work very easily. So I think it's a situation where we're gonna drive that, uh, the technology space to be developing solutions in that way. It's just gonna get continually easier. Um, you know, other than that, it's, it's the, the younger generation bringing in social media platforms who are now you know, introducing marketplaces and payments. Um, you know, the contactless payment options are obviously huge now with Apple Pay, you know, Google Pay, and what have you. Um, you know, uh, e-commerce and above store payments is huge now, order ahead. Again, a lot of this is driven by COVID, but but uh, it's, it's the younger generation generally picked this stuff up and really drove its market. So, um, yeah, I mean, Eileen hit a lot of the key points there. I think, you know, how, how uh, I guess you can get a little bit organizational on it as well and how organizations can make sure they're adapting with the space is, is, is uh, you need to hire and be representative of all age groups, right? You need to make sure you have all different generations, all those different solutions and, and opinions and perspectives uh, so that you can uh, make sure you're listening and, and addressing your addressable market and your target market and uh, just continue. And then I, I think that will, again, that's a feedback loop and that, that will cause um, the companies in the space and everybody to kind of evolve with the newer pieces of technology and kind of stay in sync, right? You, you know, you always, you, you, you see the guys and organizations that have been around that have a lot of experience and may have seen this kind of stuff before and be maybe a little bit less, less, uh, quick to, uh, to react. And then you might have the user that uh, come in and be, want to quickly react, right? Just to certain things or make decisions. And I think it's about having a really healthy blend of, of those perspectives and, and, uh, you know, that'll force that evolution in a, in a, in a, in a productive way. Yeah, I've always said there's no substitute for a competent person getting closer to the situation. So don't paint the whole millennial generation, the younger generation with a broad brush and the stereotypes uh, that clearly are more negative than what the reality actually is. Hang out with folks like Eileen and George, like I am today, uh, and, and learn and learn their perspective, really like get them in your organization, as opposed to just oh, what those people, uh, what they think. So. Well, wonderful. Well, thank you for, for sharing that. My last question for you, and we love asking our guests this from time to time, can you recommend to our audience a book to read, an online resource to follow, or a podcast to listen to that would help them improve their organization, improve their own performance? Eileen, if you could take a crack at this first, please. 
A really good podcast that I listen to is uh, it's by the Wall Street Journal. It's called Stories of Successful Women. It's really interesting to see people who have built empires and figure out what they adopted. And t- typically what I've found is they've uh, they've embraced uh, going outside of their comfort zone. They've embraced newer technologies, figured out how to apply it to their companies, and they're able to, to grow that way. Um, I participate in... Uh, in an annual conference, uh, Women in Product. So that's really interesting to hear how uh, tech companies uh, think or train. So I always um, pull a ton of stuff from that. Um, online resource. Ooh, I, uh, I go into the rabbit hole of LinkedIn every day. I think that's great. I follow all of my competitors, everyone in the industry. Uh, I'm connected with you, Jim. So I look at and read in depth what you're talking about. Uh, I have a personal interest in in finance, so I follow a, a guy by the name of uh, Phil Town. So a ton of finance books, and it's helped me uh, just understand um, f- from a uh, I would say from an investor's perspective what to look for in a business, and then I'm able to take those learnings and then apply them into uh, to partnerships and and understand someone's rationale or mentality of, of owning a small business and growing that. So that's been pretty interesting. So those are really what I do. Uh, books to read. I can't think of the last book that I read at the moment that is business related. So that's kind of been my escape uh, for from this crazy COVID. Well, I was <laughs> going to say with the uh, with the podcast, the LinkedIn, the online content, and the conferences you attend. Uh, you're good. You know, too many people are like, hey, I'm just showing up for work every day. I'm glad to hear, uh, you know, you're really going outside and uh, going from you know, your, your comfort zone into your courage zone and uh, expanding your knowledge. So, no, great information, Eileen. Uh, George, uh, what are, what's a, a, a product or, a, a, an, uh, you know, a podcast, a book or something you could recommend to our audience? Yeah, so I listen to quite a few podcasts, but one that, that, that would have you know good parallels with what we're talking about today is Finding Mastery with Michael Gervais. Uh, I don't know if you guys know this about me, but I'm a former athlete. Uh, so so um, you know Michael Gervais is interesting. He focuses on the high performance sports psychology, right? So uh, but but what he does is he he you know he interviews a lot of, of sports figures and and really gets in their head and figures figures out what makes them tick, and, and that's that's always interesting to me, right? So. Uh, he's got a close co- partnership with Pete Carroll from the Seahawks. Uh, he's interviewed Kurt Busch, Cal Ripken Jr. But then he also gets over into corporate America and does a lot of consulting work as well. So uh, he, he interviews a lot of figureheads in the corporate space as well. And so the the uh, you know performance psychology has always been something that's been interesting to me. It's parallel from sports into into business. And he's kind of a he's got the West Coast vibe. He's really he's really chill. And and he you know some of the stuff goes goes down the rabbit hole with psychology. But if you look through, I think you'll find a lot of names that are. Uh, that you'll know and might, might, you might find interesting. So, so I, I highly recommend his podcast. Um, from a book perspective, uh, a book that I've read recently uh, that I think pertains uh, to, to uh, you know, who, who the audience we're speaking to is Extreme Ownership uh, by Jacko Willink and, and Lee Babin. I don't know, uh, these are two former uh, U.S. Navy SEALs, really no nonsense guys. And, and the principle behind the book is, is, is it being a leader and owning situations. If you're running an organization or running a team and something goes wrong, it's not somebody else's fault. It's your fault, right? Why, what was that breakdown? How did that breakdown happen? And how do we build a process to make sure it doesn't happen in the future? And, you know, I, I really think that has a lot of parallels uh, in the ISB and dealer space and vendor space here as well. And, uh, you know, it's, it's been helpful to me when, you know, working with a team and, and, and really trying to, uh, you know, build out build out processes that, that, that benefit all the different constituents at play here. So that's, um, I, I recommend that book. It's, it's a good read. It's fun. Yeah, for those watching on YouTube, on I have a bookshelf behind me. Extreme Ownership is on my bookshelf. Jocko, I believe, I mean, great name, Jocko, right? Uh, he does have a podcast as well that I think expands upon that. I do have to admit, though, when mm-hmm. I read uh, Extreme Ownership, if I'm remembering it correctly, it would have like military stories and then followed by business stories. I have to be honest, mm-hmm. I could not keep up with all the military jargon and acronyms and all that stuff. So all I did was skip over all the military stuff, just read the business <laughs> stuff. And I still thought the book was fabulous and had a had a lot of takeaways. So if anybody does pick that up and you get stuck on all the military terms, 
there's well, at least that's the way that I I did it. Either way, they got the twenty bucks that I spent, right? They don't care uh, what part <laughs> of the book I read as long as I as long as I supported it. So, well, wonderful, great resources there, uh, great information today from Eileen and George. And to our listeners, we hope you enjoyed our discussion. Uh, if you did, be sure to subscribe to the RSP YouTube channel and the Trusted Advisor podcast so you never miss an episode. We'd also appreciate it if you'd rate us wherever you find your favorite podcast. My personal philosophy is the more stars, the better. And if you'd like to learn more best practices for VARs and ISVs in the point of sale channel, check out the RSP blog. You can find it at gorspa.org and then clicking on RSPA blog. Before we go, big thanks again to Eileen and George for sharing their wisdom with us today. And thanks also to RSPA marketing manager, Chris Arnold for his production work, Joseph McDade for our music. And last but not least, thanks so much to you for listening. Our goal at the RSPA is to accelerate the success of our members in the point of sale ecosystem by providing knowledge and connections. For more information, please visit our website at gorspa.org. Thanks for listening and goodbye, everybody.